Thank you. Uh, so my name is Emily Troyer. I'm a physical oceanographer at Oregon State University. So I'm maybe a little outside of um, the majority of focus in this room. I have an ongoing project with Rama in the, the, the Bay of Bengal, and I just happened to be coming to Bangalore uh, for that collaboration, and she needed someone to fill in for a speaker, so I'm here. <laughs> um, and, and actually, I, I just found out a few days ago that I was doing this and, and just flew here, so uh, you might have to bear with me in terms of jet lag and that type of thing. Um, but I wanted to talk to you today about the, uh, how we go about measuring turbulence in the ocean, because that's one of the things I do. I go to sea. I measure turbulence and then I try to interpret those results to understand the larger scale flow and circulation in the ocean. Um, this is work in collaboration with my colleagues at the Oregon State University Ocean Mixing Group. Uh, Jim Moom, Jonathan Nash, Bill Smythe, and myself are all in that uh, particular group. Okay, let's see if I can pull the picture up. So when I start to talk uh, about small scales in the ocean, I like to take a step back and think about the scales in general that we see in the ocean. Here you see an image of a sea temperature from NASA's AMSER-E satellite. And so if you look at this temperature, you see a lot of variability. The range is from minus two degrees about in the dark um, green colors up to 35 degrees Celsius in the yellows and white shades near the equatorial regions. Let's see. Here. And if, oh, wrong way. And if we think about the relevant spatial scales, they span from the basin, so 10,000 kilometers. Um, and you can see other variability in this image as well. For example, you see around the equator here, tropical instability waves of about a scale of 1,000 kilometers. This down up quite clearly. You'll see hints of our western boundary currents, like the Gulf Stream and the Kuroshio, carrying warm water from low latitudes up to high latitudes that have scales of around 100 kilometers. And around all of those boundary currents, you also see spatial scales of around 100 kilometers in the eddies and filaments that shed from instabilities of those boundary systems. We can look at even more detail if we zoom into a regional scale. So here I'm showing you sea surface temperature from the Chukchi Sea to the north of the Bering Strait. Um, we have Alaska and Russia bordering it. And again, you see temperatures that have scales of variability from the basin scale, in this case 500 kilometers for the Chukchi Sea. Across the warm Alaskan coastal current along the coast of Alaska, you see a width of about 50 kilometers. And then the instabilities and eddies that shed off of that boundary current are sub 10 kilometers in this particular picture. We can kind of keep playing this game. So here you see two temperature images from an infrared camera um, in the coastal ocean and then the upper um, open ocean. On the left-hand side in the coastal ocean, you're seeing a discharge from a power plant so that's coming out in a current that's roughly 30 meters wide. And then you see the evidence of a rip current carrying the cooler water from inshore, offshore, um, that has scales of something like 10 meters across it. Similarly, if we look in the upper or the open ocean, here's just surface images of temperature variability. Here, the widths across the horizontal um, axes are about 150 meters. And so you can see scales on the order of 10 meters and smaller in terms of the variability associated with linear cells as well as internal waves. And then if you just keep looking, here are some images from uh, Verona's 2008 that are showing two meter boxes of temperature variability on the surface of the ocean. And all of this is associated with different surface breaking um, of waves. And so when we're thinking about the relevant scales that we care about the, in the ocean, we're thinking basin scale, global scale from 10,000 kilometers all the way down to submeter and smaller. Here's a pie chart that kind of maps out the different physical processes that span that range of spatial and time scales. So uh, in this axis, um, uh, Dudley Chilton, also at OSU, has put distances on the lower horizontal axes, and they range from millimeters all the way up to greater than 10,000 kilometers. And then time on the vertical axes from subseconds all the way up to greater than 1,000 years. And so if you look at the upper left-hand um, Part of this image, you'll see things like climate change, El Nino, southern oscillation, uh, seasonal cycles like the monsoon, all of that's falling into very long time scales, large spatial scales. And then on the bottom left-hand side, you see turbulent mixing and vis viscous dissipation and the small scales that I'm going to talk about how we measure in just a little bit in the ocean. Um, and then in between, we have all kinds of different physical processes that are connecting these two scales, submesoscale eddies, mesoscale eddies and fronts, um, internal waves are some of those. And I'll mention internal waves again at the end of this talk. 
So in the ocean, the forcing is, is by winds and by uh, the tides. And those are very large scale um, forcing mechanisms. And somehow, that energy that's put in at the large scales makes its way down to the very smallest scales where the energy is dissipated. Um, and so as oceanographers, we care about all of these different ranges and scales. But like I said, we're going to be concentrating on this lower end here um, for today's talk. Uh, so one of the advantages we have in the ocean is we're working with a very big Reynolds number. For some of you that work in the lab, um, you maybe have struggles with this, but in the ocean, that's not a problem. And that's something that we're working with in, in terms of an advantage for us. Um, and so when we're thinking about resolving the inertial subrange, which is what we want to do to quantify mixing in the ocean, um, we, have, we have a large Reynolds number and a large space to work with, which is, is nice in that regard. Um, it's sitting in between the energy scales and the dissipative scales. And then I always like to give this quote by Richardson whenever I show this cascade. I think it's a, a poetic um, summary of uh, big worlds have little worlds that feed on their velocity, and little worlds have less little worlds, and so on to viscosity. Um, and like I said, we're kind of in an advantage in the ocean because we're working with large Reynolds numbers. Our ultimate goal, goal, though, is really, as a physical oceanographer, I want to do a good job of forecasting and, and understanding how the ocean is working at larger scales. And so really what we're aiming to do is, so what we want to do, though, is come up basically with turbulent diffusivities that can be put into large scale models. So we're thinking about regional models or even global models that you can't resolve turbulent motions. And so we need to parameterize turbulence in some way that we can do a good job at forecasting ocean um, circulation. And I'd also like to mention that we don't just care about diff diffusivity in terms of doing a better job predicting the dynamics of the ocean, but we care about it for other reasons as well. Um, for example, carbon that's exported to our deep ocean that's done through mixing, um, the mixing of nutrient-rich water up to the surface, which feeds phytoplankton blooms. Um, another area that we care about it is in terms of heat flux, the subsurface heat flux in the ocean to a large part is through turbulent mixing. And then the way the ocean controls um, or its connection with the atmosphere depends on that upper ocean temperature that can be affected by turbulent fluxes of heat. And so really what I'm after for eventually is something that can be very simply put into an ocean model through a turbulent diffusivity. So what I'm going to tell you about today, though, is how we go about um, understanding uh, turbulence in the ocean, and in particular, what we've done as a community to try to get at this diffusivity, um, the turbulence in the ocean. And we essentially have approached that two ways historically. And I'm going to be giving you a bit of a history in terms of measuring um, turbulence in the ocean. But one is to try to measure motions at the scales where mixing is happening, so in that inertial subrange and smaller. Um, and the other way is that we try to make inferences from the large scale motions um, that, that tell us something about what mixing is doing. So if we can observe the larger scales, maybe we know something about what the mixing and smaller scales are doing. So I'm going to walk you through a history of ocean measurements, and in particular, um, getting to how we uh, measure temperature as well as velocity in, in those small scales. So until, um, it wasn't until the like mid-1930s that we were actually able to make continuous measurements of temperature in the ocean. Prior to that time, we would make measurements of temperature at discrete levels. We'd lower what were called reversing thermometers um, in, the, in the ocean and then you know, select a depth to have the thermometer set so that we could read its temperature back at the surface. Um, and then in the 1930s, Wheelhouse developed the bath thermograph, which was the first time that we were able to measure a continuous temperature trace as, as the system fell through the ocean. And it was kind of an ingenious system. It relied just on expansion um, and contraction of a set of copper tubes inside the system. And it would record with a stylus on a piece of glass um, the temperature uh, as those tubes expanded and contracted. And then as the bathythermograph dropped into the ocean, the pressure change associated with the ambient um, pressure in the ocean would shift the slide perpendicular to that, so you would get this trace of temperature as it fell through the ocean. And so this was the first time that oceanographers started to notice uh, all of this structure in the temperature, because before that time, it was just coming from discrete depths. But for a while, they actually attributed to that something called stiction, which was essentially uh, what they thought was friction with the stylus writing on the, the glass. 
and they thought it was a, you know, a, a phenomenon associated with measurement error rather than uh, microstructure. They didn't attribute it to that um, right at first. In the 1950s, however, thermistors and thermocouples had been adapted to use in the ocean. And so for the first time, um, you know, we were measuring temperature at resolutions with accuracy enough to, to really see some of that structure associated with overturns in the ocean. So here's just an example. This is just showing a profile of temperature in depth over just maybe about five meters in the ocean, down around 100 meters depth. And you can see some of the fine structure that's associated with by turbulent below. And um, here's just a zoom in of that uh, location, and you can see all of these motions, again, that are associated with overturns. The thermistors and thermocouples were mounted on a wide variety of platforms, and those included um, things that were towed behind ships. They also included submarines. So a lot of this work was sponsored by Navy interests. And in particular, this was this, there was this concept that because the ocean was stratified, maybe there wasn't much turbulence in it. And so if you could go out and measure whatever turbulence you did see, maybe that was associated by submarine wakes. And so a lot of this was funded with this idea that you could trace submarines simply by measuring turbulence in the ocean. And here's an example of some of that work. This is um, from Grant Stewart and Mole in 1962. This was the first time that velocity microstructure was measured in the ocean. They adopted the hot film and anemometers uh, for use in the ocean, and so they were actually able to measure velocity spectra. They went out to a tidal channel in um, British Columbia, and they were, you know, they were able to collect data, and for the first time they were able to show that that scaled with a minus five-thirds slope confirming um, theory associated with the inertial subrange. In the uh, 1960s, um, Charles Cox's group started to develop the first vertical profiler. And this has become the sort of gold standard for how we measure turbulence in the ocean. So this is what we're still doing today. Um, this is a pretty incredible system because it, it used thermistors, and so it was measuring temperature microstructure only, but it recorded the data internally on paper charts as it fell through the ocean, which I find pretty amazing um, in terms of the development there. By the... Uh, 1970s, um, one of Cox's students, Tom Osborne, adopted airfoil probes to be used in the ocean, and that is how we measure shear um, microstructure in the ocean today. We're still using um, the airfoil probes in terms of uh, the measurement of shear velocity. And then at this time, sort of through the 1970s and 1980s, there were a collection of groups in the, the U.S. primarily that were developing their own microstructure profiling systems independently. And that included Mike Gregg at APL, who was a student of Cox's, um, Doug Codwell and Jim Moom at Oregon State University, and John Toole and Ray Schmidt at Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute. Um, now these systems are available commercially, but for a long time, there were really just a few groups doing turbulence measurements in the ocean. So what do those data look like? Here's um, the advanced microstructure profiler from APL UW. Here's the nose, so these fall vertically through the water column and are sampling clean fluid as they fall. Um, you see the airfoil probes here, thermistors, uh, fast thermistors, and then they typically have ancillary sensors that are at least measuring conductivity so we can get salinity and density in the ocean. Um, and they often have other sensors as well, like fluorometers or turbidity to measure other parameters in the ocean. Here you see um, just a few, I think it's about 20 centimeters of a profile in the ocean showing the velocity or shear microstructure, um, the uh, temperature gradient in depth, and then the conductivity gradient in depth. So that's reflective of salinity. And so you can right away see the sensitivity on the wave numbers that are resolved due to the molecular viscosity level and the diffusivity of heat and salinity, which are quite different from one, one another. They, they vary by about 100, from a factor of 100. And here's how we deploy these systems. So this is uh, the OSU system um, being deployed off the, the back of the Oceanus, one of the research vessels. Um, some of the systems are maybe a little heavier and might be deployed in a slightly different manner. Here his uh, colleague is just tucking it off the back. Um, but basically, they're loosely tethered to the ship, so they have to be decoupled from the ship. Um, and so we have a winch that you can take the clutch out and, and spool out the line very rapidly. So it's able to fall, not rigidly coupled to the ship, collect data on the down dive in this case. And then when it gets to the bottom, um, we can haul it back up to the surface and repeat the process. So it's basically like we're fishing off the back of a ship, 
um, collecting data. Uh, and we definitely spent many months at sea doing just this and then collecting many profiles uh, through the ocean in different places. Most of the time we try to put some type of protection on the sensors. We'll crash these into the bottom so you're able to get turbulence data within um, uh, 50 centimeters or so of the bottom. Um, here's just another set of profiles from the chameleon profiler. In this case, this is a full depth profile, but it's in the coastal ocean. So this is just 50 meters of, of water column, um, ranging from close to the surface, below the ship's wake, all the way down to the bottom. And so you can see shear here. This is the perturbation, the vertical velocity. There's a pitot tube that's on chameleon as well, so we're able to get the, a long axis component of velocity. Here's the temperature gradient, salinity, temperature, and then density. And so you see sort of a characteristic profile in the ocean where you have a surface that's fairly well mixed. Um, there's breaking waves, there's wind-driven mixing, there's a lot of energy in the small um, wave numbers, or the high wave numbers, the small uh, vertical or scales. And then at the bottom, you also have a well-mixed bottom boundary layer. So in particular, you see here a turbulent um, boundary associated with lots of shear, uh, but you don't see much temperature variability because it's, it's not stratified, it's very weakly stratified. So we can take, once we have the microstructure data, we, we apply sort of a common approach and we, we take spectra. Um, we assume a Taylor frozen flow approximation because we're getting time series, but it's falling through the water column. Um, and then we fit those spectra to universal forms. And from that, we get a quantitative measure of uh, turbulent kinetic energy dissipation or, or thermal variance dissipation if you're measuring temperature. Um, and then if we assume a balance between shear production, buoyancy flux, and dissipation, we can actually get this turbulent diffusivity, which was our goal in the first place to input into our models. And then you just have a coefficient that's a function of the Richardson number, the flux Richardson number, dissipation, and the stratification squared. Um, we often actually just assume a constant mixing diffusivity. Um, sorry. Yeah, mixing efficiency, which is about 0.2 um, on average, uh, based on a, a lot of different um, experimental results that point to that. A um, couple other things, I guess, you know, this is probably getting close to the noise floor of what systems are able to resolve, 10 to the minus 9, 10 to the minus 10, um, dissipation depending on the system. Um, and then I'm going to talk a little bit in just a second about this other peak here sitting at lower wave numbers. I just wanted to mention, first of all, there are other approaches that have developed independently, and those include dye injection. So here's some data from Woods, 1968, and he's put a little bit of dye into the thermocline and, and just watched and see how it evolved. And you can see what looked like Kelvin Helmholtz instabilities and roll-ups associated with that. People have also used dye at a much larger scale. So here's an example where Jim Ledwell and colleagues at Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute they put dye um, down at depth in the ocean. This is 4,000 meters. And then they went back you know, a year later and measured how the dye had spread. And based on that, they're able to estimate um, how much average diffusivity there was in the ocean over that time period. And so in particular, you can see over this region of rough topography, um, a lot of the dye has mixed into that area. We also use acoustics. So here's an example um, that the ocean is very good at sound propagation. No, no, this is down at 4,000 meters depth. So it's very deep, yeah. And you can see this is actually the bathymetry in this particular slide, this really black area. So you can see where a lot of the mixing is occurring. It's very rough in terms of the bottom. Um, yeah, I think the average diffusivity ended up being something like 10 to the minus 4 meters squared per second uh, in, in some of these areas over the rough topography. And this is spanning, right, this is going from minus 21 uh, south all the way up to minus 13. And so that, you know, each one of these ticks is 110 kilometers in terms of the, the horizontal distance. Yeah, I mean, 10 to the minus 4. So uh, that's, that's sort of, if you look at global energy budgets, that's kind of the mixing value that you would expect to, just by the, the average shape of the temperature at depth in the ocean. Um, it gets quieter than that, though, as well. So here is just an example. So acoustics are very useful. And in particular, um, 
because the sound speed in the ocean depends on temperature and salinity, uh, it'll, you'll backscatter off of turbulent fluctuations in microstructure. And here's an example of that from a ship that was recording um, acoustic backscatter uh, here. And then they had a towed body behind the ship. And so they took this little section here and they've, they've tilted the axes. So now time is on the, hor or the vertical here. And you can see that each time you see one of these high backscatter bands, it's associated with temperature microstructure. And here's just another image that's uh, showing visualization of that. This particular case is showing an internal wave in the ocean. So this scale is a couple hundred meters, 500 meters, I guess. And then here, this is 50 meters in the vertical. And so this is one wave that's propagating um, in this direction. And the acoustic backscatter is highlighting the thermocline in the ocean. But then you also see these billows and roll-ups on the backside of the right wave, um, indicative or reminiscent, at least, of Kelvin Helmholtz instabilities. And that bright backscatter is likely scattering off of turbulent fluctuations on the wake of the wave, um, just due to the sound speed dependence on, on temperature. So we can take these data and try to start making maps of mixing in the ocean. And that's what you see here. So this is a global map of mixing um, Diffusivity varies, the scale is from 10 to the minus 7 up to 10 to the minus 3. And before you get really excited, it's actually only the boxes where direct turbulence measurements have been taken. And so you probably can't see them, but there's 19 boxes in our whole ocean where people have gone out and measured turbulence directly, um, at least for deep turbulence. So this is the average, I think it's below 1,000 meters depth. And so, you know, the spatial coverage is a huge problem to try to go out and sample our global ocean. It's, it's a big area. Um, and so what, uh, what we've done instead is if you look at all these other little dots out of here, these are estimates of mixing based on inferences um, uh, associated with the finer scale structure that's been measured. And I'll talk about that in, in just a second. But again, it's only these boxes where we've gone out and directly measured turbulence microstructure. And that's as a community. That's not just one group measurements. Um, so what about these other dots on that map? And if you go back to these spectra, I mentioned the fact that if you look at lower wave numbers, you see these internal wave bands. And in the ocean, internal waves are everywhere. And they're, they're providing a sort of direct link from the larger scale motions to the turbulent mixing. And so if we can measure something at larger scales and know something about the internal waves, we can potentially parameterize the mixing, which is what was done in that previous map. So here's a simulation by Dodi Klomak, and it's just showing the generation of internal waves. Um, here he's got just a tidal flow. It's, it's uniform in the vertical. It's running back and forth over a bump. And then he's plotting in the lower panel the turbulent kinetic energy dissipation in the model. And so you can see a couple things. You can see, first of all, that as the flow um, goes back and forth over the bump, you generate um, vertical motions. Sometimes those motions are enough to break and convect locally, and so you see high dissipation near the, the feature. But then you also see internal waves that propagate away from the generation region, and they're also associated with elevated mixing. Here's another map by Harper Simmons. This is showing a model again, which is showing internal wave generation by the tides globally, as well as by winds. And so you see many things here as well. You see the, the storm bands um, around 40 degrees north and south. You see tides, if you look carefully, for example, at Hawaii, you see tides radiating away from Hawaii, which acts as a, a generation source. Also in the South China Sea here at Luzon Strait, that's a big tidal generation site. And so these waves that are formed in these localized places propagate far from their generation sites and end up just populating the ocean. Um, and and those, those have finer scale vertical structure and horizontal shear associated with them, which can directly lead to mixing. This is actually plotting the vorticity. I, uh, I don't know which layer he's picked, but it's, you should read it as just a trace of baroclinic motions in the ocean. So if you, if you go back to this idea, so these internal waves are acting as a direct connection um, to mixing, and, and look at data again. So here again is a similar dye plot from that Leadwell study. Um, and then this is showing microstructure measurements from a vertical profiler in that same region. And so you can see over the smooth topography, 
and bathymetry, they are very low values of mixing. And that elevates pretty dramatically over the rough topography. And it's not just constrained to sitting right at the surface of the topography. It's actually finding that high elevated mixing is all the way up to 500 meters um, below the surface. And so it's, it's, you know, the signal is getting up to several thousand meters above the bathymetry itself. Um, and so there's been a lot of work in oceanographic literature thinking about this connection between internal waves and mixing. And um, some of that is summarized here. So here's an example of using um, just the microstructure measurements that exist and mapping, um, you know, fitting ad hoc to the stratification. The bathymetry is in this uh, function E here. Um, and then also the, the energy contained in the barotropic tide and coming up with maps of diffusivity. Um, and that's, that's shown here. Um, so here's a global map of diffusivity estimated in this way. The other way we've approached it is that if you measure shear, and so now I'm talking about shear not at the inertial subrange scale, but at a larger scale, 10 meters or so in the vertical, um, and you can relate that to the character of the internal waves, then you can come up with an ad hoc parameterization to get dissipation from that. And so here you see stratification um, on the left-hand side. The panel in the middle is showing the shear at 10 meters, shear squared at 10 meters vertical scale, and then a fit to that in the black line. And then over here you see the TKE dissipation. Um, the black is a measured dissipation from a vertical microstructure profiler. And then the gray lighter shaded trace is a parameterization based on um, uh, the the 10 meter scale shear. Um, well, so in this case, it's compared well, right? Because the black line, that's how that was cal calculated. And then the gray line is the parameterization. Whether or not it always compares well is a huge question. And so that actually was my next point. Like if, so that's what's done with all of these dots that are outside of the black boxes here, just to, that type of parameterization. And the question is, is, well, can you apply that type of approach everywhere in the ocean? So for example, um, this map often shows elevated values in reasons where we have a lot of mesoscale eddies. And there's not necessarily any reason to associate those mesoscale eddies with increased turbulence. Um, and, and mixing. So there are questions there. And so there's motivation to try to improve our ability to directly measure mixing and start to fill in this map with more places where we're actually measuring the microstructure and smaller scale shear. Um, and so that brings me to my last point and moving forward. And in particular, I'm focusing on things that the OSU mixing group is doing here. Other groups are also pursuing similar avenues. So, you know, for this point number one, we want to do a better job at not in not only the space in the ocean and getting measurements in other places. Going back, you know, each of these boxes these represent maybe a month at sea time, and so there's a lot of temporal variability that is potentially not represented as well. Um, a great example of that is this one little box at the equator right here. There's actually been three cruises to that particular location, each spanning about a month, and the first two cruises we're measuring um, conditions uh, when those tropical instability waves that you saw on the first uh, temperature slide were inactive. And then the third cruise happened when an active tropical instability wave time. And the effective mixing calculated in those two differed by a factor of 10 to 100, um, just based on those conditions, even though the ship was out for a month each time. And so what we're, we're doing is we're trying to improve our ability to measure. And by, by that, I mean that we're going to try to measure longer time scales. And so the mixing group has been developing instrumentation that can get deployed on moorings. And, and this is what I'm working on with Rama and her student Rita Brat in the Bay of Bengal. And so by longer duration, I mean sensors that go out for a period of a year or more and then come back. And so you have long-term records of, of microstructure. Although you can also see some of the challenges we're faced with in that regard. So here are some sensors that were put out in the coastal ocean for just a month. Um, it's shallow. And you can see how. Uh, you know, the growth, growth is just all over them, which contaminates our measurements. The other thing is, is we're developing new, uh, new instrumentation that can be augmented to profilers. So all of those dots in that last slide, they were, um, they were part of the Argo program, which is an effort for, well, that's my time. Do I have just a couple minutes? I'll wrap up quickly. Um, and, and these are floats that are out in our ocean, and they're measuring a profile every 10 days or so. 
And so we're actually trying to put turbulence microstructure sensors on those floats. And that's a collaboration we have with a group at Scripps. Um, so I had a couple other points with these two efforts, but I think I'll just stop there. And we, we, have, we, we have a couple of extra minutes, if you wish. You? You okay, can, yeah. well, I'll show you some data then. Yeah. I haven't done much of that. So here's an example of a year-long record from um, one of the moorings in the Bay of Bengal. Um, the top shows the wind stress. The second panel is showing the precipitation. The third panel is the surface heat flux at the surface of the ocean. And so basically, you see the monsoons. Um, you can see the, the northeast monsoon and the southwest monsoon in the wind stress, and then the transition period where the winds are very quiet in between the two. This high peak right here was associated with the passage of a tropical cyclone that passed over the mooring. Um, it was a, actually a tropical storm when it passed over, but it later developed into a cyclone. Here is the ocean's response. This is the upper ocean temperature at a few different uh, depths, as well as the sea surface temperature, the upper ocean salinity. And then this is the diffusivity that's measured from one of our microstructure sensors on the mooring. And so the biggest thing that you see is that during the transition, the effective diffusivity drops, I don't know, is that four orders of magnitude from something close to 10 to the minus 3 all the way down to 10 to the minus 5 or minus 6. I guess it's three orders of magnitude. And then the other thing that you see is that um, during passage of the tropical cyclone, you see very elevated mixing for a very short period of time. If you just look at the distributions of those diffusivities, they're shown here. So you can clearly see the difference between the transition period as well as the monsoons and then the tropical storm. And then here's an example of the latter effort. This is a, a deployment of one of these autonomous profiling floats in the Bay of Bengal again. So it's deployed around 18 north. In the Bay of Bengal, you can see the transect that these two floats took. They were in one of these mesoscale eddies. And you see the tides in the, the transect and these wobbles that you see in the vectors of where the float was going. The upper panel is showing the surface heat flux in gray, and the turbulent heat flux in black. And then the second panel shows you sea surface temperature over the upper 50 meter steps. So you see the diurnal cycle as the ocean is heated on a daily basis with the sun. The third panel is showing salinity. So the Bay of Bengal is a little bit interesting because it's one of the places where salinity dominates the stratification in the ocean. So temperature is allowed to do funny things, like you're able to have cool water sitting over warm water, for example. And yet the stratification is still stably stratified. Um, and you can see that in the temperature gradient here where you have both signs. It's, it's varying from blue to red, um, from positive to negative. And that makes for interesting uh, properties when you think about the turbulent heat flux. So here's the diffusivity from the sensor. And then here's the turbulent heat flux. And basically, on a daily basis, it's changing sign. Because at night, mixing is acting to mix up the warm water from these subsurface warm layers into the surface and heating the surface of the ocean. And then and during the day, mixing is acting to cool off the dynal warm layer and mix up even this colder water from depth up to the surface of the ocean. So you can get kind of these interesting feedbacks with the surface temperature and then potentially also with communications in the atmosphere. So in conclusion, um, turbulence measurements in the ocean have benefited um, from the work of a large, uh, large body of people and groups and, and basically adapting existing technologies to really challenging environments. Since turbulence is a property of the flow, it's patchy and intermittent, and so increased measurements and improving our ability to measure is really important. And to do that, we need new measurement approaches, um, basically to increase our sampling capabilities. And, and the community as a whole is working on that effort. So I'm done. All right. Yeah, let's thank the speaker and take a few questions. Very interesting presentation. Yes. We had a microphone there. Is there any speciality in selecting those boxes? No. Or uh, yeah, so each of those projects was sponsored by an independent effort, right? And so, for example, the Pacific one, the intention was to go and look at those instability waves at the equator. Um, and of course, only one of those three uh, projects saw that. I could go back and look at some of the other ones. I think there was a large box in the Southern Ocean that was to look at uh, mixing in the circumpolar current. And so each one of those would have had their own specific reason why they were in that particular location. No speciality other than I mean, their individual projects. Yeah, the, I mean, that, that again represents the full body of profiling measurements over um, the you know, 20 years, 30 years that those systems have been in existence. Okay. So what's the Richardson number for this uh, oceanic flows? 
uh, wouldn't you expect a Bolzionovo curve kind of scaling uh, if it's stably stratified? Uh, um, so I don't, I don't I, you'll have to maybe talk about that later, but Richardson numbers, they're hard to estimate. So I'm thinking about just uh, N squared over shear squared, for example. Measuring shear is actually pretty challenging on the same scale that you're measuring stratification. And so, for example, you know, our profiling systems can measure stratification at submeter scales, but we typically use acoustics to get the velocity um, for the, the shear part of that measurement. And those, you're lucky if you're in the 10 meter range. But you do see, I mean, the Richardson number goes critical at times. Uh, it varies a lot, though. Um, shoots up all over the place. You can, however, measure flux Richardson numbers, probably, yeah. Um, I was just going to ask, aside from covering a better part of the ocean, is there a grand vision for this uh, whole program? Um, yeah, you know, I think, it, it again, it's often specific to the project at hand, but the way I've framed this, and I think what the community would like, is to see improved predictions and forecasts of ocean models. And that's not just for understanding the circulation, but it's for understanding how the ocean then communicates with the atmosphere, what it's doing to the ecosystem in the ocean, and, and really just you know doing a better job of getting at how the physics are important for other aspects. What's the best precursor for, let's say, monsoons over um, the Asian subcontinent or Indian subcontinent? Um, so the project that I'm involved with now in the Bay of Bengal is looking at improving forecast of the interseasonal variability in the... But that's already very late, right? I mean, it's not a precursor anymore. Um, I'm sorry, what... The precursor meaning something that will tell you... Starts, yeah. ...when uh, things might happen. So let me just maybe summarize what the project is and see if it addresses that question. And so um, models right now have interseasonal variability in the monsoon, but they're not very predictive. What we do know is when you couple them to the ocean in an atmospheric model, you do a better job at that representation. Um, and so the thought is, is that if we can understand what the ocean is playing in that role, we might do a better job of, of improving those models. More importantly for the Bay of Bengal, like if you look at ocean models, typically the stratification is too weak. It's not strong enough. They're not doing a good job of representing all of that fresh water that comes in from the Ganges, um, as well as the precipitation. And so the question is, is well, is that just some um, you know, artifact of the model? For instance, the resolution is not high enough? Or is there something about the mixing parameterization that needs to be adjusted to do a better job at representing the ocean stratification? Um, and that then comes into the precursor question, because maybe you care about the stratification in the bay you know, that's evolved over the year in terms of the onset of the monsoon um, the following year. Salinity in the um, Arabic sub, um, uh, sea, isn't that right? I mean, especially um, near the Gulf. Big, and that might have an influence as well. Absolutely. Uh, like if you look at a map of sea surface salinity, the, the Indian Ocean stands out because the Arabian Sea is incredibly salty and the Bay of Bengal is very fresh. And the interchange of those waters is an important aspect, um, undoubtedly. Yeah. Uh, could you please go back to the temperature in Bay of Bengal plots? Just the last slide? Yeah, just the last okay. one before this. Yeah, uh, in this third one, why does this temperature profiles vary, start varying with depth after about April, after about March or something, and before that they are all at the same level? So that's the transition. So at that time, you are putting a lot of heat into the ocean, and there's very little mixing that's happening. And so you're basically just warming the surface of the ocean. Why does this add, with depth, the temperature decrease? Uh, with depth, the temperature decreases. That, uh, again, you're heating, you're preferentially heating at the surface. Right, and most your surface flux is all at the surface. Short wave penetrates a little bit, but it's it's decayed pretty rapidly in the ocean. And so, if you're not mixing that heat down or moving it in some other way, you're going to heat the surface of the ocean more than you are at depth. So, within the time period, I, we can assume that within the time period from Jan to March, the, it gets mixed up, and then the, all the plots again collapse. Um, yeah, so it's it's fairly well mixed at this time period. The winds are higher, the mixing's higher in general. Is that what you're pointing out? Right, right. And, and then the winds, I mean, the winds essentially shut off during the transition. Up here you see the magnitude of the winds. Okay. So then you, just, you heat 
Just one more question. Uh, what about the velocity? Does the ship affect the velocity measurement? Because uh, like how deep? That's why you go pretty deep. Uh, how, yeah, how, so how shallow can you go up to? With the turbulence profiler? Yeah. You're typically in wake. I, I would say on a typical ship, uh, upper wake of the ship. And so you, you're not resolving that. With the floats, you don't have that problem at all. So you're able to get turbulence to within you know, 20 centimeters or so of the surface. So it depends on the platform, but the wake of the ship is definitely a problem for profilers. Any other question? Yeah. Yes. Uh, thank you for the talk. Uh, I wanted to ask that you, you showed that uh, global mixing profile. And so is there any way that I can correlate that global mixing profile with some dominant uh, Lagrangian coherent structures? Um, people are working on that. Um, I don't have a map of it here. You know, I think most of that work's been in 2D so far. Amit can actually maybe do a better job at answering this. And so, you know, they're looking at turbulence and mixing associated with 2D um, Lagrangian coherent structures. I don't know that much has been done in terms of the 3D aspect. And this map, of course, is showing mixing. I maybe didn't do a good job of saying this, but below a thousand meter step. So a lot of that work, they'll use uh, surface altimetry to get the, the velocity product that then is put into the LCS calculations. Do you want to add anything to that? Any last question? Yes, this. Uh, what's a typical cost? I'm here. Oh. <laughs> So typical cost associated with one campaign of data acquisition? That is exactly the question. A ship is very expensive. Um, it depends on the size of the ship. Uh, you're looking at maybe $30,000 a day for one of the ships that goes out to the middle of the ocean. Um, and, and it's not just the cost of the ship itself. It's the cost of you know people being on that ship for that amount of time. So yeah, each of those campaigns is, is very pricey. Um, does that answer your question? $30,000 a day for just the ship. <laughs> just the ship. Yeah. <laughs> Anything else? Uh, if not, then we'll kind of come to this end of the session. Very exciting talks.